the debt that we're taking on is at such a level and presents such a fundamental risk to our great country that I truly believe, and it pains me to say this, and troubles me to say this, that it threatens the very foundation of our country. Democrat, independent, Republican, debt is no respecter of political party. And we are at a point now, and this is not, we're going into the fourth year where the president has us, and look, this is not a partisan statement. This is not a partisan statement, but he is one third of the government, the administration is, and we have a, yet a fourth budget where we have over a trillion dollars of added spending. It is immoral, in my view, for one generation to consume and to pass it on to the next. Now, the vote in question because it was a very difficult vote, probably one of the most difficult. I really don't recall one more difficult than that. Um, I listened to the district. I listened to, we had town halls. I, you know, we, we watched our Facebook page, which by the way, I encourage you to get on whether you, it doesn't mean you support everything we're doing when you click like, but that's the little phrase you use. Uh, we'd love for you to stay informed in what we're doing. But um, here's, here's the problem that we run into and that I was faced with when I voted for that particular, uh, the debt limit increase, is that there was no plan, there was no alternative presented to me uh, at that moment as to what would happen the day after if we didn't approve the debt limit. Basically, it was a self-imposed debt limit. No one was, in, our lenders weren't imposing it. It was us imposing the limit on ourselves. And so basically what would happen if we had not extended the debt limit when we got to that final point that, uh, you know, basically all we could have funded was like the military, uh, social security, and just a couple of other things. About 60% of our federal budget we pay for, and 40% we're putting on a credit card, essentially. And, 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 and I, as I talked to them, all of my friends, I said, now what happens to the other 40%? What happens to NASA? What happens to... Um, um, you know, the Department of Energy, or what happens to, you know, you can just go on and on, the Department of Justice, what, you, you know, there was just no plan whatsoever. And uh, I didn't like it. Um, I, 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 you know, it was just a very painful vote. But it seemed to me that the best way to preserve our credit rating and to give us a little more time to, to come to some agreement, that it was the best decision. I put my card and wherever it is and I pressed yes we need it back I pressed yes and, and that's where we are now it's very important for me to share this with you tonight because I think I owe it to you you know where I'm representing you I have the privilege of representing you is that absent some comprehensive uh, agreement that in a substantive way addresses and arrest this trajectory that we're on I, I have got the, the strongest inclination to, to vote against that because at some point, and I hope later rather than sooner, but at some point I'll be in a car riding home from Washington for the last time. And I have to know, I have to know above all else that I did everything I could to set this country on a better path. I will not facilitate, I will not be part of a group that for whatever reason, whatever good intent, just allows us to go on and on and on with this borrowing. Because there does become a day of reckoning. The borrower becomes the lender's slave. And when your banker turns on you, y'all I know. I mean, one day they're going, Scott, can we loan you some money? Next week, when things go south, no return phone call. When your banker starts stops loaning you money, it's oftentimes it's very quick, and you can wake up and go, "Well, what happened? Everything was what happened? We don't need that kind of moment." And you know, right now we have we owe as a country about a hundred percent of what we produced as a country. Now this is not far out from where Greece was or is. So the time is now.
I've called upon the Republican leadership. Look, our schedule needs to reflect the challenges facing our country. We need to be in Washington right now addressing a comprehensive solution to our fiscal challenges. Mr. President, I've called upon the President on the House floor. Mr. President, give us a plan to rally around that in a comprehensive way arrest this trajectory that we're on. And I really don't see one. I, I don't. And I, I, that is not a partisan statement. The House has passed a budget that does this. It takes 25 years to balance the budget. It has us borrowing money for 25 years. But at least it's a plan. And my hope would be, here's our plan. Mr. President, put your plan here. The problem is, there's no plan here. Now, uh, again, it's not a partisan statement, and if someone knows of a plan that I'm not aware of, and I don't mean this to be funny, uh, but if you know of a plan that I'm not aware of that is comprehensive and gets us to where we're not borrowing more money than we have coming in, then please, or that we're spending, please let me know, and I mean that. The time is now to make bold decisions to set this country on a better fiscal path. <laughs> One of your constituents has an idea. It may not be a whole plan, but it's a thought. Okay. Pat Wary says, of use of appropriated funds, her concern is if a person doesn't graduate, i.e., and they have full use of Pell Grants, something should be done to make them give the money back. I had the most interesting discussion the other day with the president of one of our universities in Virginia. The president came by my office, and it was fascinating. Um, walked through these issues, and the, and the topic was Pell Grants. And the point the President made to me was this. Cut, it's okay to cut Pell Grant funding. In fact, it needs to be done if, if you go after the fraud. And, and the President then described the outright fraud. Now, this was the President of one of the leading universities in the Commonwealth. And I was amazed at this, that I really didn't fully understand it. You can get like $5,500, nothing wrong with that. It's not the sum of money. And I think the Pell Grants have been really helpful to so many, especially low-income folks, folks who really need it. But some, like in any system, take advantage of it and abuse it, and it hurts all. And they can basically start a course, the President described this to me, start a course never intending to even go to classes or do anything like that, and keep the $5,500, and then circle around and do it again. And I said, really? You, no. I mean, this was so bad, so egregious, that I thought, this is low-hanging fruit. What American wouldn't agree to this? I mean, this is common ground. And I always look for that. I'm not a real big believer in the word compromise. It kind of implies that you well... I mean, I'm really compromising my principles. No, we can find common ground. I describe it like this. It's like, think of it as two circles. And, and you know, here's our, my, my position and maybe someone who disagrees with me. If we keep pushing this, these circles together, eventually they start to overlap. That is common ground. And we need to, we need to seek out common ground. We need, to, we need to persevere in our search for it. When we find it, we need to not be afraid of it. We need to celebrate it. And we need to have men and women who are willing to vote for it. That is what, this is how, this is who we are as Americans. This is how we prospered for 235 years. And this is why we're wrapped around the axle right now, is because that's not happening. We're afraid of it, or I'm not sure what's going on up there. But... We've got to find the common ground, and th this issue of Pell Grants is, is part of it. And I had the privilege of sitting next to uh, Dr. Deborah DeCroce. Many of you probably know her. She ran uh, Tidewater Community College. Had the privilege of sitting next to her at the State of the Union address in Virginia Beach. And I started talking to her about this, and she said, Scott, you're absolutely right. This is a legitimate concern. Let me know how I can help. She's one of the sharpest ladies I know. And I called Nathaniel Ferguson in her office. I said, Nathaniel? Call Dr. Croce and let's get together. And I know we're focused on job creation and, and I'm on health armed services. I'm not on the right committee to move this forward, but we can't let this go. Maybe we can work through the right committee to, to move this, this forward. Um, see, this is where we can cut expenses and not 
and not hurt those who need the money the most. This is a good idea. So hopefully we can move it forward. I'm so glad that question came up. I had no idea the Pell Grants would come up. All right, last question. Last question. Last okay. question. I'm wrapping three into one. So uh, you will, uh, okay. I'm testing your memory here. Okay. Um, there is, Matt wants to know when we can jump the last hurdle so that we can begin wind farms in terms of energy. Um, Mark would like to know uh, what's being done to stop, actually, to support the efforts to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. And the last question would be about the tone in Washington to actually get some work. Yes. Okay, Mark, uh, on wind farms, uh, I've really been pushing the menu. I really think that, you know, pick a number, one to three percent of our effort, our funds, I think need to be directed at wind. Um, I've admitted that it is more costly. But I really believe that we need to push forward with this. Anyone who takes comfort in the fact that we have, say, 200 years plus of coal, I don't take comfort in that. It raises the alarm bells because I know that time moves on and we have an obligation to our children and our grandchildren. And I'm really pushing uh, Dominion on this. The, uh, now, I certainly remember the third one, which was Tone. Help me with that second one. That was the... The Bay. Oh, the Bay. What a treasure the, the Chesapeake Bay is. There is not a body of water in the world that is like the Chesapeake Bay. You know what did Captain John Smith in his journals? It's amazing. You go back and read history, and he would describe in his own words how he could see through 30 feet of water and see the oysters on the bed at, at the bottom. And they were these oysters were 8 to 10 inches long. It's just amazing. The bay is not like this now, so we know the bay is hurting. Um, we've had some successes. We've, uh, gosh, in the Lincoln area in Virginia Beach, for example, lots of oysters are being, uh, uh, about 1,500 acres that were off limits for watermen are now open. And you can eat and feel good about eating uh, a Lynn Haven oyster. And uh, this is bringing employment back to um, the area through uh, aquaculture and, of course, on the eastern shore as well. And uh, I have a 20-member 20 plus member Chesapeake Bay Advisory Board. Shannon's done a wonderful job with that. It's well run. Uh, people, one of the co chairs is, uh, is on the board of the Chesapeake Bay uh, Foundation, correct? She's a director. And we have a really diverse group of folks. We have uh, Waterman, we have the mayor of Tangier, Mayor Uker. What fine folks they are on the island of Tangier. And no one has, I think, in my mind, a greater interest in preserving the bay. And the the watermen uh, and the water women uh, families of Tangier. So we have this very diverse group of folks, and uh, they get along just great, right, Shannon? And and we've got some really good common sense, common ground solutions that we're moving forward. But I'll close with this on that matter: is that we truly we have a moral obligation, a moral obligation to leave our children with clean air and clean water and clean soil. We are all going to the same place. I've never met a person who says, I don't care about the Bay. If I did, I think the person's a Neanderthal or something. I mean, who, who's not for supporting and cleaning up the Bay? We've got to move in that direction. Sometimes we just differ on maybe a timetable. And finally, with respect to tone, well, I really believe we're doing that. And the word says no. Here, this fine young man went to VCU. He didn't know I was going to pick up, pick on you. But I'm going to actually give you kind of a closing word. Stand up if you would, sir. This fine young man is with you about 16 hours a day. And tell him about the, you know, Terry and I, you know, we uh, wanted to open up a, a place that we uh, have been fortunate enough to be able to have folks over. And I'm going to put you on the spot, as well. But what have we been doing in Washington? Um, the discussion started with a lunch with the congressman, his wife, a friend of mine, myself. And we talked about how Democrats meet uh, with their caucuses and the Republicans meet in their conferences, but there's never really a time that Democrats and Republicans meet together to discuss their concerns. So the congressman said, why don't we do this at my house? So we had staffers from the Republican Party that work on the Hill, the Democratic Party, to, to come, excuse me, uh, staffers that work for Democrats, staffers that work for Republicans, to come to the congressman's house we simply just had a discussion. Uh, it was disarming because it was at the congressman's home. And we just talked about ways that we can work together. And the congressman's going to continue that effort. He's going to be speaking with the African-American males on the Hill uh, next month. And it was just a great way to see how both parties can find common ground. I'm so glad I don't have to run against him. that I made who said who serves on two committees with me, Hanson Clark.
Chuck. He's from uh, he's from Detroit. And uh, to be very candid with you, he's got a very different background than me, and he's got a very different story. And it's just been wonderful to uh, to get to make friends on the other side, quote on the other side. Look, we have got far more in common, far more in common, and far more that binds us together than than you hear uh, from some of those podiums. And I told people, and I've shared it, shared it directly with Senator Reid. I've shared it directly with uh, Speaker Boehner, and uh, and. Uh, and, and also to uh, a fellow Virginian, Eric Canner. I said, I think we need to spend a little less time at the podiums and a little more time around the kitchen table listening to one another. There's a few other folks I just wanted to, to, uh, to recognize. Uh, I see that my good friends uh, have come in. Uh, the executive director of the Fort Monroe Authority, man, he's kind of navigating these very difficult waters. I hope it's getting better. Uh, Glenn Oder, thank you for being here, Glenn. Beautiful city of Hampton, it's Wallace. George Wallace is here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Uh, these are ways that you can get engaged, get involved, you know, really stay informed. I, I share with folks, forget the party, forget the Democrat, Republican, Independent label. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment in America, and we all need to be making informed decisions and hold public officials accountable for results. And the best way to do that is to carve out a little bit of your time to stay informed. A practical way to do this, and I'm awfully biased in favor of it, is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's sent out by email, and uh, we have a lot of fun putting it together. And uh, you can go, when you go to, uh, uh, is it ritual.house.gov? That's R right. Yeah, R-I-G-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. <laughs> there, that big, right there. Ritual.house.gov. First thing that you'll see is a little invitation. I should know, right? Is an invitation to sign up for our email update, and you can get that, and you'll know really what's taking place uh, on the issues that we're, we're bringing forward. And of course, Facebook is a very practical way, and that's the Twitter link. And uh, Barbara, thank you again for being here tonight. It's a real sacrifice, I know, on your part uh, if you experience a little delays. I did get over here and. Hopefully we won't have a delay going back. I just hope I live long enough for the third crossing, but... Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Those folks in Richmond, I tell you what. Okay, know, thanks so much. But I want to remind everybody as we close tonight, uh, we have these cards for you to join the conversation. So please obtain one of these uh, on the information table outside. Keep the blue portion for yourself and let the others stay. The congressman has mentioned the website where you can interact. And finally, someone lost their phone and dropped it outside. So if this phone belongs to you and you can identify it, we'll leave it with staff as we close. Uh, thanks for the company. There will be highlights tonight at 11 on News Channel 3.